Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 38 years we have engaged the community in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Our hour-long forums are free and open to all, and we invite you to join us in the sanctuary of Westminster Presbyterian Church for upcoming events. Information can be found at westminsterforum.org or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Barbara Brown Taylor is an Episcopal priest, teacher, writer, and self-described spiritual contrarian. She's the best-selling author of 14 books on faith, culture, and spirituality, including Leaving Church, An Altar in the World, and Learning to Walk in the Dark, which was named one of the best religion books of 2014 by Publishers Weekly. She has served on the faculties of Piedmont College, Columbia Theological Seminary, Candler School of Theology at Emory University, and the McAfee School of Theology at Mercer University. She was recognized by Baylor University as one of the top 12 most effective preachers in America, and in 2015, she was named Georgia Woman of the Year. We were privileged to welcome her. <laughs> they love you here in Minnesota, Barbara. We were privileged to welcome her to the forum when her book, An Altar in the Wor World, was published, and that was about 10 years ago, almost to the day. We're happy to welcome her back to explore themes in her newest book, Holy Envy, Finding God in the Faith of Others. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Barbara Brown Taylor. you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Be the change you seek in the world. Love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Leave room for holy envy. Bromides are lifesavers. The fourth one might be less familiar to you than the other three. It comes from Krister Stendhal. Swedish bishop and biblical scholar who proposed three rules for religious understanding between new neighbors of different faiths. The year was 1985. The Church of Sweden was a state church, Lutheran, since the Reformation. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was opening a new temple in Stockholm. And there was more than a little anxiety about the newcomers from Utah which was how Bishop Stendhal found himself in front of a microphone addressing a press conference. If anyone expected him to exercise his office by defending the traditional faith of the nation, they were surprised because what he did instead was offer a brief ethic for engaging religious strangers, whether they were fresh from the other side of the world or had been living for generations on the other side of town. First, he said, when you're trying to understand another religion, you should ask its adherents and not its enemies. Second, don't compare your best to their worst. And third, leave room for holy envy. He didn't say much about what he meant by that last one, but as soon as I heard the two words together, they drew me in, an oxymoron as intriguing as divine decadence or good grief. How could one of the seven deadly sins be holy? What might make it so? And why was it vital for religious understanding? The best way to test it out, I thought, was to introduce the concept to my students in world religion classes at Piedmont College in rural Northeast Georgia. Though they came from many parts of the U.S. and from some other parts of the world as well, most at that time identified as Christian. Whether they were at Piedmont by choice or by parental fiat, they still lived in what Flannery O'Connor once called the Christ-haunted South. 
the county surrounding the college, the county where I still live, has one bowling alley, one movie theater, three rivers, and 62 churches. <laughs> it's not Minneapolis. <laughs> still, there were plenty of students using their distance from home to get some distance on their home religion as well, confident that they had a lock on the basic tenets of Christian faith. One God, one Son, one way, one truth, one life. This may help explain why Religion 101, Religions of the World, was always fully booked. For 20 years, every semester, always full, sometimes with a waiting list, because students had questions about religion they didn't believe they could ask at home or at church or because they weren't satisfied with the answers they'd gotten there, both about their own faith and about the faith of others. But once word got out that you could not pass Dr. Taylor's class unless you worshiped false idols, <laughs> and that there were free meals after the field trips to masjids, temples, monasteries, and synagogues, students didn't even ask to see the syllabus first. <laughs> they were in. What I knew and they didn't was that they were in for more than a scenic tour of the world's great religious traditions, which was, after all, what the textbook promised them. Colorful maps, concise timelines, photos worthy of National Geographic, and essential vocabulary words for each of the five religions that we would study over the next 15 weeks. But there was nothing to smell in that book. There was nothing to eat in it. There was no music. There was no silence. There was no body heat. That's why field trips became so vital to the class, because they gave students a chance to get off the bus and meet people who complicated things for them. Kind and funny and generous people who didn't match their stereotypes of Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists or Jews. People who said inspiring things and who forgot to turn their cell phones off, and who poured tea, and who said, what a great questioner, please come back anytime, bring your friends. Once that happened, there was no going back. Students would never again believe everything they thought or everything they had been taught about people of other faiths. When they got back on the bus, their certainty had great big cracks in it which is, after all, what the best kind of education is designed to do, to shake the foundations, which is, after all, <laughs> to shake the ground so hard that the brittle things break and the flimsy things fall, clearing space for stronger, truer things to be built in their places. It could have happened in the classroom, I suppose. I could have invited practitioners of different faiths to come visit us instead of going to see them. It would have been a lot cheaper and easier. I wouldn't have had to crawl down the aisle of a dark bus after all the students had gotten off to pick up their forgotten water bottles and candy wrappers. I wouldn't have had to take home all the fragrant Indian food they left on the bus because it wasn't chicken. But if I had invited visitors to class instead of going to see them, the burden would have been on them to find the college and locate the classroom, to enter it to 25 pairs of staring eyes, to endure my introduction, to say something funny, to put everyone at ease, and then to spend the next 60 minutes summing up the entire beauty and meaning of their faith as its sole representative before the students started filling their backpacks and the bell rang. I tried that a couple of times, but you know what? I got jealous of the vulnerability of my guests. Watching them rise to the challenge of being perfect strangers, I decided that my students and I ought to be doing that instead. We should be leaving our comfort zones to go meet other people in theirs. We should be entering their sacred spaces without knowing the rules, without even knowing whether we had dressed right or where to put our shoes. 
To offer hospitality, that's one thing and a good thing, but it puts you in charge. Receiving it is something else altogether, especially when you and your religion are used to being in charge. Being a guest can transform you like being a host never can. It levels the playing field. It puts you in receiving mode, which has a lot less ego in it than giving mode. It also accelerates the learning curve as you find yourself in the minority for once, seeing the world through other people's lenses instead of expecting them to use yours. One of the biggest surprises for students who got off the bus was that no one tried to convert them. Since they expected others to do to them what they had done to others, <laughs> The Christians, at least, were prepared to resist the evangelization they were sure was coming. As often as I assured them that visiting a Buddhist monastery would not make them Buddhist, any more than visiting France would make them French, <laughs> they made sure I knew what they would and would not do. They would not bow when the teacher came into the room. They would keep their eyes open while everyone else closed theirs, and they would trust Jesus to know they were there for extra credit and not for enlightenment. <laughs> One of my favorite students was, still is, named Brian. He was an Episcopalian, so he was up for enlightenment. <laughs> but he still had no idea what to expect, and so of course he was uncomfortable. On the Tuesday evening that we attended a public lecture at Drepung Losaling Tibetan Buddhist Monastery in Atlanta, Brian decided he wanted to try sitting on a zafu for the entire hour instead of on a folding chair with people my age. So while the other students found their zones of safety, Brian chose plump black cushion in the third row on the right, while I settled into a folding chair a couple of rows behind him. We did stand with everyone else when the teacher came in the room, and then we sat back down as he fiddled with a lapel mic on his crimson robe. He was a Tibetan monk who looked every bit the part, sitting cross-legged at a low teaching table in front of an altar populated by a great many Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Gurus, and Rinpoches. First he led the regular crowd on that Tuesday night in a chant that they all knew by heart. Then he invited us to spend five minutes in silent meditation before he began his talk, which was titled, Cultivating Happiness. I tried not to look around the Dharma Hall to see how the other students were doing, but Brian was right in front of me, so it was impossible to miss how much effort he was putting into sitting straight and holding still without falling asleep, because college students are always tired, and college teachers are too. So I closed my eyes until the teacher cleared his throat to let us know the quiet time was up. He had to clear his throat a couple of times before he could get a full sentence out without croaking. I don't know whether it was the pollen or all that chanting. Then he had to move his microphone around a little bit when some people in the back of the room kept saying, can't hear, can't hear. Then after taking a sip of hot tea someone had placed in front of him, he finally got down to business. Had we ever noticed, he said, how our unhappiness with not being in a relationship quickly turned into our unhappiness with the relationship we had just entered. <laughs> had we ever noticed how soon our unhappiness with not having a job turned into our unhappiness with the job we'd just found? In no more than four sentences, he'd made his point. Our happiness is not dependent on our circumstances, which are always changing. Tapping his temple with the fingers of his right hand, he told us that our unhappiness is a product of our own minds as we persist in locating the problem out there instead of in here. While we spin our wheels trying to control things beyond our control, we ignore the one thing within our power to change, which is the way we see things 
and the compassion we're able to offer. When the monk took another sip of tea, Brian craned his head around so I could see his face, eyes wide, eyebrows up, mouthing his words really big so I would understand. And what he said is, this is just about life. making his eyes wider and wiggling his eyebrows a few times. <laughs> this is just about life. At the end of the hour, the teacher wrapped up his talk with another brief period of meditation. And later, when I read Brian's field trip report, I learned more about his experience on the Zafu, including what happened during the last meditation period. He said it was his first attempt at meditation, so he could hardly believe it when he felt a deep warmth coming up his left leg straight toward his heart. First time, 10 minutes in, and he was being given a taste of enlightenment. Then he opened his eyes and saw the person next to him had spilled her coffee. <laughs> which was wicking up the left leg of his jeans. So I saved his report along with one written by a young man who had been much more concerned about going to the monastery. Here's what he wrote afterwards. There may have been some rituals and ceremonies that I was not sure I wanted to take part in, but when we arrived, it was different. To his surprise, he said, he was able to clear his mind during the meditation periods, reaching a place of calm that he had never reached before. He said, the whole experience made me think about changing my perspective on what's going on in my life. Not about changing my religion, but about changing the way I look at things. This may be what we've been learning in class about different worldviews. <laughs> but I did not understand the concept until I saw it firsthand at the monastery. There's that crack again. Learning the word worldview is troubling enough if you never knew you had one. But once you visit another one, it's hard to deny that there are plural ways of seeing and being in the world which don't match up nearly as neatly as you might have hoped. All religions are not alike. There are as many irreconcilable differences between them as there are within them. Remember the Lutherans and the Mormons? And still, I believe there is so much to be learned, to be gained by visiting the religious neighbors, even if you are a perfect stranger, because how else could you have seen your own faith more clearly without seeing it alongside theirs, the best of theirs, laid alongside the best of yours, without any illusions about the worst you're both capable of doing in the name of your religion. As you may imagine, it was often difficult for Christian students to see something lovely in another faith. The divine singular was so much a part of their religion, one God, one Son, one way, one truth, one life, that to find beauty in another way felt like treason to them. When they experienced a new calm at a Buddhist monastery or sensed the deep reverence in a Muslim's five times daily prayer, it felt like telling Jesus they were seeing someone else. <laughs> when they loved the drumming at the Krishna temple or the sweet peace of the Shabbat service at the synagogue, it made them worry that they had lost their faith. One of the things that always slapped my heart the hardest was hearing from those who had called home all excited to tell their parents what they were learning in class, only to receive a warning about falling for all that stuff, or opening their minds so far that their brains fell out. I think that's why they took to the concept of holy envy so gratefully not because they knew or cared who Christer Stendhal was or why he put those two words together in the first place, but because they had already experienced the envy and they were relieved to think there might be something holy about it. With just a little help, 
They began to see how admiring the high school football players in Michigan who kept training for their championship game while fasting during the month of Ramadan, that might inspire them in their own faith to greater spiritual courage. After a few of them kept a modified kosher diet for a class project, they wrote about how hard it was to find anything to eat in the class cafeteria and how much new regard they had for Jews who thought of God before every bite they took. One student wrote, one guileless student wrote, I honestly was not expecting to learn anything from this assignment. I just thought it looked easy. <laughs> who knew, she finished, that food could teach you life lessons? Even students who identified as atheist, humanist, or undecided warmed to the idea of holy envy, which they adapted to meet them where they were. One student wrote on his final exam after I incorporated a question on holy envy. He said, I've been ignited by holy envy in a lot of ways. For instance, I love the Hindu notion that karma is not measured or judged by a higher power. You are responsible for your own actions. Whether I decide to believe in a religion or not, I will keep this moral code of self-accountability with me. And another said this, when it comes to holy envy, one thing that really sticks out in my mind is when we went to the mosque on our field trip and the Imam spoke to us ahead of time and what he told us is my holy envy. He told us how he doesn't wish to convert us to Islam. He just wants us to be the best Jews, the best Christians, the best people we can be, regardless of religion. This was the most beautiful thing I have ever heard, and it's my holy envy because I wish Christianity was this way. Grading these final exams was always a complete bummer because how do you critique the grammar in a paragraph like that? <laughs> how do you come up with an objective rubric for measuring a student's heightened empathy or his or her increased ability to tolerate existential ambiguity? <laughs> After a couple of years of suffering with students who scored lower on their finals than they had on any of their quizzes, I finally accepted what the results were telling me. It was the experience of the class and not the content of the class that was transformative for them. This was the best class I have ever taken in college, wrote one student at the bottom of the exam on which he earned a low D. <laughs> for 15 weeks, he and others like him had lived with the kinds of questions no textbook, no teacher can answer. They'd considered the often contradictory answers of five great religions, discovering more diversity within them than they'd ever expected. Their vocabulary list had well over 100 words on it in five different languages. Their timeline covered 4,000 years and seven continents. By the time they got to the final exam, their brains were so scrambled they had learned so many new things about so many old religions, including their own, that the lines between them blurred. Eh, do the Four Noble Truths go with Buddhism or Islam? Does Talmud uh, belong to Hinduism or Judaism? Did Constantine start the Protestant Reformation? <laughs> These were such elementary questions for basic religious literacy that uh, grading final exams was always a complete bummer. But <laughs> students didn't hang on to the right answers as well as either of us would have liked. When they left Religion 101, it was the relationships they never forgot. How is Swami Yogeshananda at the Vedanta Center a young woman said to me in the hall a full year after she'd taken the class, I still think he needs a cat. <laughs> Another student wrote to ask if he could tag along with the current class's field trip to the mosque since he thought of another question he wanted to ask our guide, Bilal. 
A couple engaged to be married returned to Drepung Losaling on their own time to learn more about medicine Buddha practice. When I showed up with a gaggle of students one Tuesday night, they were already there, sitting in the second row of the Dharma Hall on Zafus with their legs impressively crossed. Later they wrote to tell me they had become Episcopalians and were very active in their church. There are so many problems with this, I cannot begin to tell you. Read the book to find out. <laughs> or just read the headlines. 11 killed in synagogue massacre, suspect charged with 29 counts. Terror attacks at New Zealand mosques leave 50 people dead. At least 200 dead in Easter Day attacks on Sri Lankan churches and hotels. How do you keep saying, leave room for holy envy under headlines like that? How do you keep believing that the way of life is to love your neighbor as yourself or to do unto others as you would have them do unto you? I wish I knew. All I know is what I learned from 20 years worth of college students and from the people of many faiths who welcomed us into their most sacred spaces, though we did not have a clue. Because they were out on the edges of their traditions, welcoming us in from the edges of ours, we found at least a local way to start being the change we sought in the world, though we did not speak each other's religious languages or imagine the divine in the same way. As it turned out, what we had most in common was not our religion, but our humanity embodied in such astonishingly diverse ways that it began to seem this might be the will of the Creator and not a deviation from it. Neighbors whose gift to each other is not our sameness, but our difference, our ability to shake each other's foundations so that the cracks in our separate certainties open up and when we reach out to steady ourselves, find human hands as warm and as woundable as our own. For Christians in particular, this is a basic tenet of the faith, to see God's image in those who are not made in our image, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves. Is it working yet? Oh, don't ask me that. It's the wrong question. Are we cracked open yet? Better question, I'm cracked. Best question of all, why have faith at all? Is it to make sure you get to heaven? Is it to rest in the confidence that you have a lock on God? Or is it to discover how many faces the divine has and to practice giving yourself away every day to some perfect stranger? as you learn how to be a better one yourself. You will be the judge of that. But whatever you decide, thank you for being here today, for opening your mind so wide that your hearts fall out. <laughs> and to this church and this city for inspiring deep and abiding holy envy in me. Thank you very much. To those of you listening on the radio and applauding at home or at your office, you're joining a packed sanctuary here at Westminster Church listening to Barbara Brown Taylor. Even our choir loft is full. I'm about to call on the choir for an anthem. Are you all ready? <laughs> They're ready, all right. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson, the senior minister here at Westminster Presbyterian and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is writer and teacher Barbara Brown Taylor. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank our broadcast partner, the statewide network of Minnesota Public Radio News, 
heard in the Twin Cities at 91.1 FM, and our online media sponsor, MinPost. And special thanks today to the co-sponsor of the forum, Hennepin County Library, with funding from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hennepin County Library is committed to nourishing minds, transforming lives, and building community. Barbara Brown Taylor, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from the audience. And she's frozen in terror in her seat. There she she's comes. She's shaking her head. No, please, no. <laughs> Let me begin by uh, pushing back a little bit on the holy envy concept. When does holy envy become a kind of unholy appropriation of another tradition, uh, trying to fit it into the tr uh, tradition in which it is not meant to fit? I'm thinking of a Christian community celebrating a Passover Seder, for instance. This question has come up at almost every place I have been with this book because holy envy assumes there's another kind, right? And I think that in different ways, uh, a lot of us have, um, well, followed my example earlier in my life of being a spiritual shoplifter, or as some Native American friends of mine say, a poacher, <laughs> you know, of everything from a dream catcher to a sweat lodge so that Tim already named um, a kind of unholy envy, which is to appropriate other people's traditions and, and furthermore, adapt them to your own circumstances so that they um, are ripped from their roots and are planted in other dirt where, uh, where they didn't earn a place. Um, assimilation is, is another way. I think sometimes uh, I know my crowd the best and Christians are always fast to assure people that we are all one. And it took um, someone who, who was not Christian to say to me, that's the voice of empire, and it means we're about to take you over. <laughs> and I'd never heard it that way, because I'm in the majority, right? I'm the giver of the oneness. Um, so there are a number of ways that it can go south. Uh, however, I found I don't usually recognize those ways until I talk to people who are not in my tradition. They're the best equipped to tell me that putting Ganesha decals on my gym shoes is not the most... I haven't done that. Radio <laughs> audience, I have not done that. Um, but there are certainly ways in which um, I think that the, you know, Christians can flip it around. I don't know if you remember what happened when Madonna started wearing great big rhinestone crosses. But, but you, you know, you can look around and, and, and see how that goes. Wonderful question to, to wonder for yourselves what un unholy envy might look like in your own lives or people you know or in the culture at large. Here's a question from someone who just describes the, the, themselves as spiritually fluid, ordained, and a Zen Buddhist priest uh, studying at United Theological Seminary in the Twin Cities for a Master's of Divinity. Welcome to the future. Yeah. <laughs> this is very much the future. There's, there's wonderful literature starting to come out about multiple religious identity. And I cannot believe, first of all, this is not a new thing. Um, it, it, it happens all the way from the little church I served in Clarksville and saw the Methodist pastor in the back row at the 8 a.m. service saying, I just needed to get out of the house. <laughs> Uh, it, it, all the way from that to people who have embraced yoga and meditation and however far you wish to um, separate that from the religions that gave them to the world, it, that's hard to do. Once on an airplane, my husband leaned forward and asked someone who was going to a drumming conference, you know, what kind of conference they were going to, and they said, well, it's secular, a secular drumming conference, and my husband said, I hope the spirits know that. <laughs> Let's just keep going. So now we can get to the question. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Which was? I haven't asked it yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How do we help adults improve their religious literacy in this crazy political climate in the U.S.? Well, just do it. I mean, the, the crazy political climate in the U.S. isn't going to prevent a single one of you from increasing your religious literacy. Not a single one of you. <laughs>
and what I love is even if you live in a little county by, like mine, um, there's a Theravada Buddhist temple nine miles from the college in a county of 35,000 people uh, because we've got minimum wage and it means we've got people from all around the world living in a little rural county in Georgia. So it's, uh, you know, to, to get to know a new neighbor can often be as easy as going to a grocery store in town that sells specialty items or getting on your computer. You know, one of the good things about them is uh, are the ways in which you can listen to interviews and teachings. It's one thing that people who grew up with computers will never um, give up, is the ability to visit people in other places of the world that they may never physically um, get to. So um, to read books, to, um, to watch documentaries, to meet the neighbors, to start pressing some local, perhaps, clergy to plan some trips. If they haven't already done that or failing that, arrange them yourself, making sure before you go that you're welcome and that the place you want to go is very interested in sharing what they have to learn with people who, to their great surprise, would like to know more about it uh, and, who, and who come to listen instead of to talk. Uh, so so the, the opportunities are as endless as the number of you in this room. One of the lines that jumped out of the book as I read it uh, referred to the, the malaise uh, or the decline of the mainline churches being due largely to the fact that there's nothing particularly compelling happening in them. And there's a question that arises out of that uh, point of view. Is the death of the mainline church inevitable? And I know, by the way, you're not referring to Westminster. Uh, oh, <laughs> never to my host churches. And, and if so, what do you hope the resurrected church would look like? Uh, thanks for that easy one. I think, first of all, in the same way, uh, one of the great learnings for me has been to acknowledge, recognize, celebrate the diversity of the major world's traditions is to come smack up on the diversities in my own. I have even given up using the phrase, the church, which may be a huge mistake, but in my experience, there are churches and they are not all declining. Uh, there are people being blown through the doors of new church plants and old established churches who have never stepped foot in them before. Um, because they were not raised in households that had a vocabulary for the transcendent. Um, I even know one young woman who goes to a church and says she doesn't believe in God or Jesus, but she's a communitarian, and it's the only place in town she can find community um, with people who are not all her age and are not on their cell phones all the time. So uh, uh, the, the flow is going both ways, and if, if the main line is decreasing, I, I hope there is a huge crack opening up with a lot of learning in that. Because it, it is true that even a, a lot of youth pastors I know right now say that all their young folks want to know about is other faiths, other religions. Um, and the beauty of doing that is every now and then you'll hear someone from another faith tell you the beauty they see in your faith, the wonderful thing they see in yours. Um, and that can be quite fabulous coming from the mouth, you know, of someone else and not a preacher or teacher in your own tradition. You do, do describe in the book moments when you've experienced people who are not Christian expressing a kind of holy envy about the Christian tradition in which you have re been raised and served. And what is it about our tradition, those of us who are Christian, that is, others find t to envy? Okay, now this is a trick question because when, when you begin exploring the neighbors, you go with beginner's mind, right? Uh, and so you see the best. I mean, in some ways, Christopher Stendhal didn't need to, to make his rule number two for my college students because they saw the best everywhere they went. Um, I think if you have been in a tradition a long time, you can also see the worst. You're familiar with where people have missed the point entirely, usually people in your own denomination. Um, so there's a way in which, you know, the depth um, that I know in my tradition makes me smile gratefully, but kind of laughingly when people, you know, tell me about how our religion's all about love all the time, unconditional love. And I think that's so wonderful you think that about us. <laughs> But one of the best compliments I got was from an observant Jewish friend who said what he envied about, about me being Christian was I could eat any damn thing I wanted. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting thing. It wouldn't have occurred to me. 
This was written by someone who lives near a newly built mosque in a small St. Paul suburb. What would you suggest I do to be a good neighbor to that mosque and its inhabitants? Uh, make a contact in that masjid and ask the question of a member of the congregation and don't assume you know what being a good neighbor would look like, would be my first um, answer to that. Um, because it is assumptions about what it is to be a good neighbor that can so often assimilate or appropriate the neighbor, right? So that you do do unto others what you would have them do unto you, but that's not what they wanted you to do. <laughs> So that would be the, the first thing. Uh, and because you brought up the construction of a new mosque, it is remarkable to look at zoning boards and see how, um, how a lot of conflict around new religious neighbors is being acted out right there. So one of the better things any of you could do would be to get on the zoning board um, in, your, in your local community because architecture, for some reason, raises anxiety higher than a storefront you know, does when a big, beautiful place goes up next door because um, the money is there for once, that can uh, thrum the strings of anxiety in a community like almost nothing else can. When my congregation received angry calls, one of our people here asks, for our support of our Muslim neighbors, the common argument was, we believe in a living God, theirs is dead. How do we combat this line of reasoning? for those who reject our acceptance of people of other faith. Let's exclude all the excluders, don't you think? <laughs> I think, uh, no, that is not a serious thing. Don't clap, wait a minute, you see the problem in this? Do you see the problem? I mean, it is, it is it, again, a thing that has come up everywhere I've traveled with this book is that people who are on board with the welcome and, and with the learning curve and when, with the cracks and the certainty get very upset you know, with people who do not embrace that. And yet, you know, if I, if I go to my identity, Christian identity and central Christian teachings, I better get over myself. You know, I had better find a way to count to 10 like Grandma Lucy taught me to and find some way to respond that embodies the teachings of my own faith, which is not to put my hands around someone's neck or say, how can you say that? Or that's disgusting. You know, or another thing that will simply widen the chasm that's already there. So good luck with that creativity, spiritual maturity and transcendence um, of yourself. But I do find that is one thing all religions do have in common is get over yourself. <laughs> you know, by, by any of these rich practices that have been offered to you, but it's really time to get over yourself. How can I find God in the faith of others if that faith represses those in their faith? For instance, women in the Muslim faith in many countries. Um, first of all, I might get to work on the repression of women in my own country and tradition first. <laughs> and then I would endure the, um, the suffering that comes with knowing that and yet not comparing their worst to my best. Um, and, and not to let the media deliver the world to me. Uh, the, the media is allowed to deliver parts of the world to me. When they deliver it to me in a never-ending news cycle, every tragedy is multiplied that many times, and the neighbors of that faith around me suffer every time the story's repeated. So it seems huge to me to keep my eye um, on the thing in that other tradition, and this would this is a, an example that comes up a lot, but I could I could tell you things in other traditions where I put on the brakes. I'm not particularly interested in the ten Buddhist hells, for instance, the cold ones and the hot ones, and you know the rich descriptions of that. I just sort of cherry pick, you know, the best of the other traditions. The opposite of that is cherry picking the worst of the other traditions. So I have no answer to that except that it's a true thing that every one of us runs into um, things that feel like they're not about justice, I mean, that, that are not about religion, they're about justice and liberation and equality and freedom. Um, uh, and yet I'll just end where I began. It's often good to clean one's own house first. Mm -hmm. Could you address what you think are the sources of our anxiety about other religions? 
You know, that's where Psychology 101 should have been a prerequisite to Religion 101. <laughs> And Jonathan Sachs, in his book, Not, Not in God's Name, a book about religious violence, does some wonderful psychological work in there about the processes of scapegoating, of projection, of um, human groupishness, which he even kind of astonishingly says precedes religious violence, that it's human groupishness that creates the animosity that then gets baptized as religious instead of the other way around. So there are certainly ways in which um, the uh, forms of extremism which exist in every tradition that I know about are, are often fueled by a, a cultural or ethnic or economic fear of being diminished or replaced um, that causes one to um, disown God. I have a chapter called Disowning God, and not every tradition uses that language, but um, to decide one owns God <laughs> is uh, the first step down a road that is uh, not going to be loving to those who don't call God by the name you do. I'm just going to stop that answer right there. <laughs> uh in light of the recent violence by religious extremists, uh, and in light of the violence in, particularly in synagogues, by people we have called white nationalists or white supremacists, are we coding over uh, the, the fact that the, others might think of those people as Christian extremists? Do you think there's a, you know, we, we immediately think of Islamic extremism. We, we don't talk much about Christian extremism. I'm not smart enough to answer that question, but I'll tell you what, um, a, a, a difficult realization in writing this book was to read my New Testament in a new way and to see the anti-Judaism embedded in it because of when it was written and the circumstances under which it was written. So that when I look at FBI statistics for religiously motivated hate crimes, at over 50% are anti-Jewish hate crimes, that's against less than 2% of the population. There is something gigantic going on there that, that may be rooted in the Middle East, but it's also rooted in Christian scripture, and there's no getting around that. Um, so I, I have a huge question about what Christians do when, when we reach those passages in corporate settings where people are gonna hear them in a sacred place, you know, in front of a cross, and say the word of the Lord after them that we've got, um, again, some more hard thinking to do. Again, Jonathan Sachs said, peace involves a profound crisis of identity. And, and I, as Christian, feel that profound crisis of identity when I face what my sacred texts, and not mine alone, but mine are the only ones I can get to work on, um, how murderous they have been and are murderous to this day. I just got hate mail the other day from a way in which I'm still using language that someone found blood libel. Do you use sacred texts of other, uh, other, other traditions in your own spiritual life? And if so, to, to what effect? I'm not gonna say that on the radio. <laughs> I do, I do. I'm known to do yoga. Uh, I'm known to engage, um, like the, one of the first people whose question you read, to engage forms of Buddhist meditation, um, largely out of the Tibetan tradition, but I'm, I'm very attracted to other forms as well. I think largely because they offer me a, a, a silence and a centering that's not available in my culture or in my religion at present. Though centering prayer is present in Christianity, anybody who knows Thomas Keating's work knows where he got his inspiration. You know, so he found a way, I think, to to bring those gifts home to Christian tradition. But, but certainly yoga and meditation, and then because I live with a man whose central practice is Lakota spirituality, there's a great deal of recognizing the spirits of all living things around me. Um, and it's why I don't get invited back to some places, because I'm apparently a pantheist, which I didn't know. <laughs> Um, but, but I've certainly absorbed that as well. I understand what Native Americans mean by the entire earth being medicine, if you can find it. So. The, the, the largest growing segment of uh, 
Americans in religious affiliation surveys are none of the above, or atheists, uh, agnostics, those who don't uh, claim a religious tradition. Is atheism, agnosticism, are, are those types of faith? Can people find God in the faith uh, or the commitments of an atheist or a, an agnostic? I will refer anybody who's interested in that to the um, Pew Religious Landscape Survey, which will give you some interesting factors about the undecided, the unaffiliated, who are called nuns, N-O-N-E-S, which I can't stand, because that sounds like a null set. Nothing going on there. Um, and what, what I found was that the agnostic group was quite small, and within that, what I found is that agnosticism and atheism doesn't mean no sense of a beyondness or a wish for moreness or an aching um, care uh, for the earth or for other people or for creatures. You know, the, the, one of the biggest slanders out there right now is that people who claim a, a religious identity of atheist are people with no moral values. You know, you'd never vote for for public office. So uh, I'm, I'm very uh, defensive of the spiritual but not religious in whom quite a bit is going on. Uh, but for whom old formulas have grown old, and for whom old language uh, has died, and for whom old, old forms are begging to be recreated, and uh, who, are re who are doing that in their communities. And it might be a book club in one place and a hiking club in another, uh, but as Christian, I recognize fruits of the Spirit and am willing to let God decide who's up to what. We have just a few seconds left. Are, are you hopeful about the state of religion in America today? How long do we have to define religion? <laughs> I am hugely, I have enormous faith in what my religious language calls the power of the spirit, which is a wind that blows and nobody knows where it comes from and nobody knows where it goes and that doesn't mean anything's wrong with you. Um, it, it is the way the divine works. I have enormous confidence in the future of the Spirit's activity among human beings. Amen. Thank you, Barbara Brown Taylor. <laughs>